message. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our workshop, Building and Publishing a Website. My name is Ria, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session, and I would like to begin with the land acknowledgement. So McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe Nation. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous people whose presence marks this territory on which people of the world now gather. And now just for some housekeeping, uh, you can ask questions in the chat field during the session and we will compile them for a Q&A. This session is being recorded. And we're gonna get started today with Mr. Jacques Lenormand, who is currently a faculty lecturer and program, program, sorry, coordinator for our professional development certificate in full stack JavaScript web development. A few notes about Jack. Jack has a master's in computer science. He's a former Google software engineer and the former head of education at Concordia Bootcamp. He's also the creator of Wakata.io and the co-creator of LingoRacer.com. And now I'll just uh, pass the baton on to Jack. Jack, you're muted. You're muted. Welcome to our session, publishing your first website. I'm excited to teach you how to publish your first website. And I'm excited to help uh, to teach you, for some of you, it's gonna be your first steps into tech. And the first steps are always the most exciting steps. By the way, so publishing a website is the kind of skill that is taught in our full stack JavaScript development program. More on that later. In today's activities, uh, we are going to, I'm going to explain what HTML and CSS is. And I'm going to go over publishing a website on Glitch. Glitch is a website that lets you publish websites. So it's a little inceptional. And it's free and it's very easy to use. So when I teach students to publish a website, I always start with Glitch. And then once they get the hang of publishing a website, they can go off to something a little more professional, such as Gatorhost or DigitalOcean or any of the other hosting providers. But as far as a learning tool, when you're taking those first steps and you're not sure of your footing, Glitch is a great website to publish a website. I'll also talk a little bit about how you can continue improving your HTML and CSS, which doesn't mean much to you because I haven't explained what HTML and CSS is, but trust me, these are things you need for websites. And time permitting, uh, we're going to have some hands-on practice, but every time I do this, we never have enough time, so don't hold your breath. About myself, I, am, I have a very long title. Uh, program Coordinator Information Technology, Non-Credit Professional Development Certificate Programs and Full Stack JavaScript Development is my title, which is crazy long. Basically, I am the coordinator and instructor for the JavaScript Full Stack Development Program. Uh, I have a master's in computer science from McGill. Uh, I also have an MBA. And as we have said, former Google, former Concordia Bootcamps, creator of Wakata.io, which is a website with tons of resources on web development. So I am a full stack developer and I develop sites to help other people become full stack developers. So I use my full stack development skills to help other people become full stack developers, which is also a little inceptional. So let's start with the biggest question du jour. What is HTML? Uh, it is a written language created for the purpose of making websites. HTML is an acronym, hence why it has no vowels. But what it stands for, hypertext markup language, is completely irrelevant and you should, you should forget that it is an acronym and you should just treat it as 
a noun. <clears throat> because what it stands for is incomprehensible. Hypertext. What does that mean? Well, I mean, it does have a meaning, but to regular people, it doesn't. So HTML language for creating websites. So I will demonstrate the simplest possible HTML you could ever write. And I will talk about some things, some features about HTML, which are counterintuitive. Uh, so let's just jump right into the glitch. <clears throat> By the way, if you have any questions, can you uh, just put it in the chat? Ria, can you monitor the chat and interrupt me if anyone has any questions? Yes, no problem. I can do that. Thank you. So glitch.com right here, glitch.com. By the way, this is being recorded and you'll be able to rewatch this at a later time. This website, I love this website. I also have deep respect for the people who created this website. They're longtime entrepreneurs in the tech industry. They're very famous. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click on the big button. This is very user-friendly. There's a new project button. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click it. And I'm gonna click on the first thing. And as soon as I click it, I officially have a website. So publishing a website is that easy. All you have to do is, is type in glitch in your address bar or do a Google search for glitch and then click new project and you have a website. My job here is done. Just kidding. We're gonna get a little deeper into things. So they, they, uh, when you start a project on Glitch, they give you a default basic website. It's the same site for everyone else, uh, for everyone who starts a new site. And it's basically going to be, hi there. I'm surprised they didn't write hello world. Hello world is the prototypical first website. Instead they write hi there with an exclamation. Uh, we didn't write this. We don't know what it means. There's a lot of foreign characters here uh, and different colors and some things are italic and I'm just confused. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete all of this. And I'm gonna create for you the simplest possible website you could ever create. Right there, you just write some text. And if you look at the website it creates, I'm just gonna go ahead and zoom in so you can see, hello world. So I wrote hello world and that is actually HTML. So most things you write in English are actually just HTML. And the computer is like, oh yeah, I can display that. And when your browser visits the website, it displays hello world. Good. So what if we wanted to have hello and world on two different lines? Like so. All right, so you have hello, and then later on you have world. I'm just gonna add a whole bunch of spaces. I got spaces here, spaces there, spaces everywhere. Now, as a normal human being, I would expect that in my website, there's gonna be a hello at the top right, and there's gonna be a world somewhere in the middle of the page. Because as a human being, this is how I imagine how things work, right? I should, I should see what I write. What I write is what I should see. However, website has not changed. That is so weird. So in fact, all of this was ignored. All of it. The browser, the browser read this HTML and said, I'm just gonna ignore all this white space and I'm just gonna delete it. So the question is, how do you get hello and world on two different lines? I just want to do the simplest possible thing, which is to put hello on the first line and a world on the second line, but HTML is not letting me. And this demonstrates some very important points. It demonstrates that uh, what you see is not what you get. That's something you have to really internalize if you're doing HTML, it's the first thing you have, you have to learn. The second thing uh, that you're gonna learn, and this is true for any computer language, is that easy things can be surprisingly hard to do. And in this case, the easy thing is to just put two words on two different lines, which is not letting me do, 
how do you put it, how do you do it so that you can actually put two words on two lines? So we're gonna discuss how that's done, but to do that, I need to explain a few things. And um, why I'm explaining these things will become apparent in a few slides. So first thing you need to learn for our awesome task of putting two words on two different lines is what a tag is and what an element is and what content is. So all these, all these words, I'm just gonna throw all these words at you uh, because we love learning new words, right? Uh, so there's actually four things you need to learn. Opening tag, closing tag, content, and element. And we're going to go over them in great detail. So uh, visually, you can see the difference between an opening tag and a closing tag, right? And you can see the similarities between the opening tag and the closing tag. Notice that they both have these little greater than, uh, less than, and greater than symbols, both in the opening tag and the closing tag. So remember to put them, and if you don't put them, your HTML is gonna be completely incomprehensible to the computer. That's another thing that all computer languages share. Well, 99.99% .99 of computer languages share. It's that if you, if you miss one character, the computer just does not understand what you're trying to do. Computers are very, very stupid. I apologize, my laptop, you've served me well, and I love you. However, let's be real, real talk, Mr. Laptop. You're not, this, you're not, you're not, you're not smart. I'm just going to say it. I know it's mean, and it hurts me more than it hurts my laptop to say it. Computers are stupid. Uh, so if there's anything that, the, if they are confused in the least bit, if there's missing a single character, they're just going to throw up the, their hands in the air and go, I can't deal with this. I'm going home, right? So you need to be super careful when you're writing this stuff. Um, so going back to my element here, when I'm writing my opening tag, I always have to remember, start it with a less than symbol and end it with a greater than symbol. And in between the less than and the, Greater than the meat of the sandwich is going to be the tag name, which is P. Now the tag name can be a name. It could be one character. It could be 10 characters. Um, different tags serve different purposes. So do not be too focused on the P. I wrote P here, but I could have written div. I could have written table, button. There's a whole bunch of different tag names. And they all serve a different purpose. Also to note, the closing tag starts with a slash. Do not write a backslash. If you write a backslash, the computer will not understand what you're trying to say. So write a slash, which is a diagonal from bottom left to top right. Let's see. I'm going to check if I have any questions so far. Do I have any questions? One question that just came in is, is Glitch as useful as WordPress to create a website? For what kind of web project is it useful? So Glitch is very useful for people who are learning. It was designed for learners. It is not designed for, for so WordPress is really designed for companies and maybe individuals who want to further their goals, often financial. Um, so WordPress is not built to help you learn. It's built to help you do things and be effective at what you want to do. Uh, so this is useful for web projects built by students. And once you know this, uh, I'm going to answer someone's question a bit. Once you know this, once you have a good understanding of HTML and CSS, once you've conquered that piece of knowledge using the appropriate tools to learn, then you can move on to the next piece of knowledge, which might be to learn WordPress or, uh, I don't know, Shopify or, or another platform or content management system or e-commerce platform. 
Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Marie France. Next question from Salma Fransa. Could you please repeat the step to open the first project? Absolutely. So you go on glitch.com, G-L-I-T-C-H.com. And then you click on new project and you click on the first thing. I hope that answers your question, Selma. Just close this one. I lost my Zoom. Where did you go, Mr. Zoom? Where's my Zoom? How is this even possible? We see everything normally, but right now when you open this box, I don't know what the box is. It blocks the screen for us. So we oh, okay, okay, perfect. I found my Zoom. It was being sneaky. Okay. Uh, Can you close the box that's in the upper right corner? Like yeah, that? Perfect. Yeah. It's better now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, the box is back, sorry. Oh, it's the chat box. Here we go. All right. So let's get right back into the slideshow. If, oh, Jesus, that's from the beginning. Okay. So, so let's analyze this piece of text right here in the middle where I'm furiously moving my cursor to try and highlight it. So this is an element in its entirety. It has an opening tag and the tag name is div as a closing tag, which is also div. And hello world is not part of the tag. Hello world is the content. So who can answer the questions on the board? I'm just gonna let the audience speak. Who wants to um, volunteer to answer the two questions at the bottom of the slide? Who is brave enough to say something in front of 97 attendees? H1 is the opening tag. Perfect. That is correct. <laughs> and what is the closing tag? The dash H1. Right. So we don't actually say the dash when we say the tag name. Okay. But otherwise, perfect answer. <laughs> so let's focus on the stuff that's in between the opening tag and the closing tag. We call out the content. Um, and the content in this case is just text. Now the tag name can drastically change how the, uh, the content is displayed. So let me give you some examples using Glitch. Uh, let's see, let's see EM. So I use the EM tag and we can see that now, hello world is italicized. It's like diagonal, it's like, starting to fall over. It's drunk. This is this is the this is how you make text drunk. You EM it. Question, EM stands uh, for do, emphasize. Pardon me? Sorry, do the tags have to be the same in the beginning and the end or can they be different? The opening tag name has to match the closing tag name. So you cannot write this. This is like bad. And as soon as you write it, Glitch will tell you that it's bad. And it's gonna underline things. It's gonna really communicate in as many ways as possible that it is unhappy. So I hope that answers your question, Milen. You're the one who answered the, you're, I'm, I'm assuming you're the one who asked the question. 
I hope I got your name right. Yes. Perfect. So that's what EM does. Uh, let's look at H1. So H1 makes the text bigger and bolder. Does it actually make it bolder? It makes it bigger at least. Yeah, it makes it bold. So H1 makes your content big and bold. It is a basically a header and it is used uh, much of the time to identify a section of your website, which is why it's called a header. It is equivalent to something you see in a textbook where you have a big title that describes what is coming after, for example, a chapter title or a section title. So that's how H1 modifies the way that the content is presented. Uh, P will be hard to see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put hello world and then right underneath, I'm gonna do P hello world. You can't really see it, but there is there is a margin in between. Let's ignore P for now. One thing that's interesting and that solves are the existential problem that we had that I presented to you before, which is to put hello and world on two different lines. Does anyone, do you all rem remember how existentially threatening this particular exercise was? Well, you can solve it using div because what the div tag does is it puts the content on its own line. Hello and world is now on two different lines. Hallelujah, we, heard, we have solved our issues with the wonderful div tag. A question from Bonnie. She's asking, how do you specify font type and size? Good question, Bonnie. In fact, Bonnie, do we... No, I know another Bonnie Mac, Never mind. Uh, good question, Bonnie. The answer is you have to use something called CSS. So you have to learn another computer language. So again, I'm so sorry, Bonnie, but easy things can be much harder than they should be. But that's the world of computer languages. We will talk a little bit about CSS, just a, just a little bit uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, Jacques, I, I actually, can I just ask a question instead of typing it? Absolutely. Okay, I think we do know each other from possibly Swing Dance. Oh, buddy, that's <laughs> oh my God. I, I thought I knew your name, now I recognize your face. So I have a couple of questions because I don't know Glitch. I've actually, uh, I usually use WordPress, but it's good to know basic stuff and everything. I know some of these tags. But so you mentioned, is it just in Glitch that we can't define uh, type font type and that and and what is that font that's appearing that is something that is inherent in glitch that's just a basic the font that everyone has to use and how do we determine background color if we want to do something it oh, can wow okay Bonnie because we, you're, we are we know each other for so long I'm going to answer all these wonderful questions uh, when no font is specified then uh, it uses basically it's your browser that decides the font and my browser has, has decided that's Liberation Serif. But if I was on another computer, the computer, if I was on Safari, it would look different, for example. And, and does that mean that whatever font that, it, like our computer would uh, actually have a default font, but everyone else would have a default font on their computer. Therefore, they would see it in their computer's default font. Is that it? Exactly, right? So you can actually explicitly state the font. But not through glitch, you mean? And you, you can do it through glitch. I will show you how, but I apologize everyone who this, it will be confusing to some people. So for those of you who are already a little on Rocky Foundation, you can ignore it. I'm gonna write uh, font family, not a space. So, you have to use a computer language called CSS, which I just wrote here, and you can you can explicitly specify the font. So here I said that it has to be a monospace font, but you can actually write uh, a font name like Open Source, 
And if the, per, the, the person who's viewing the website doesn't have that font, it will default to something else that will. Right. So what, what people typically do, uh, you can actually tell CSS, or you can also put it in your HTML. You can actually specify where to find the font if you don't have it. So the browser will actually download the font when it goes on the website, which is super useful. Also, you can specify several fonts and the browser will choose the first one that's available. And what does CSS stand for? It stands for a cascading style sheet. However, like most acronyms, that is completely incomprehensible. Um, basically, I mean, I think the fundamental question is what is CSS? And it is a computer language that is used to communicate to the browser how things will be aesthetically speaking, how they'll be viewed, how they'll be placed. So background color, font, text color, sizes, things like that are all specified in CSS. Okay. Thank you for the great questions from a great acquaintance from long ago. Uh, we have a comment from Mac. Well, wow, that's two. Two messages from Mac. We have Bonnie Mac, and now we just have Mac. Before div, BR could be used to separate. I don't know if there was a before div. Div is like the land before time when it comes to HTML. Um, I think I think from my understanding, div has always existed. It was just born when HTML was born. Uh, Question from Sadaf. He said, "Can we use the CSS code in HTML doc in Glitch?" Yeah, you can always you can always insert CSS directly into HTML by using the style tag. Now notice there's an opening tag and a closing tag. This is the recurring theme in HTML, closing tags, opening tags. You can always put uh, CSS directly into HTML. Some people prefer to separate their CSS and their HTML. In fact, this is common practice in all companies and all websites that are relatively useful and large. But to go back to Max's comment, BR could be used to separate. BR has always been there, but, big but, uh, it was never really recommended. So I recommend you avoid BR. It, uh, what are the, one of the reasons I'm going to recommend that is if you use it, you will be judged by other web developers. They'll be like, oh my God, you use BR? Or they might think, they might judge you in their heads. And then they might go, who taught you to use BR? And if anyone asks that question, you do not say you learned it here. You say, I learned it at Concordia. We have a question. Uh -huh. Ian has a comment. He's saying, I'm gathering this is not an intro course for first timers. Ian, I am sorry. We are diving into some complicated topics. We are going to jump right back into the basics in a few minutes once I answer other people's questions. But it is for first timers. Uh, we, we're just getting sidetracked at the moment. And Anna is asking, does it matter if you write things all in one line or split? doing it for just ease of reading? Question. Absolutely. Let's, let's tackle that question, Anna. Uh, you can actually write everything in one line. And it doesn't really matter. It does matter a little bit if you put a space or not. So I mean, I'm not in this case, but sometimes putting spaces does add a little bit of spacing when it is viewed. However, 90% 90, 90 of the time, you can put everything in one line without any spaces and it's going to look the same. It doesn't really matter. Now, why would you choose to put things in one line or multiple lines or what style do you pick, right? It's somewhat of a personal answer, but there are guidelines to make things easier to read and write. And so I think that putting Iraqi. Hello World on two different lines is easier to write, to read. Sorry, someone had a comment or a question? 
Yeah, there's another question from Bonnie. She says, why can't we use VR? What is the difference between that and this? Good question, Bonnie. So let, to answer that question, let me show everyone what VR does. So we ran into the conundrum of Hello World being on one line, but we want Hello World to be on two lines. Well, some people might say, just add VR, which this is, by the way, a little weird. I haven't explained this yet, but some tags do not are not closed. And VR is just one of those tags because it has no content. Uh, BR just indicates that there should be a new line and we see here that there is a new line, right? So BR is another option apart from div. Why is it not recommended? Good question, Bonnie. Um, right, so what's nice about divs is divs allow you to style things. Um, which I will talk about it much later in this workshop. VR is much more limited in its use. Um, I think that it's one of those things where web developers just decided that something is bad and then it just became part of our ethos, became part of our culture. Uh, honestly, there is no harm in using BR other than the fact that you will be judged. I hope that answers your question, Bonnie. Oh, that's another reason. Thank you, Marie-France. <laughs> Marie-France just answered Bonnie's question. Why, why is BR bad? Uh, because it is not quote unquote, I'm gonna use a new and big word, semantic. Uh, so when you use a div, I explained that we used it so that both hello and world on two different lines. But it also serves another purpose uh, for screen readers or people with some sort of um, disability where they can't actually read or other agents that need to analyze websites such as, such as search engine crawlers. Uh, it indicates that this is a section within itself. So this is a piece of content uh, that is separate from, this is in some ways special and separate from the rest of the page. And in fact, the word div stands for division. So you're indicating that uh, this is a part of the website. And that's why we say that it is semantic. You can ignore that word because I hopefully will not use it for the rest of this presentation. And that's one re another reason why people don't use BR. Uh, Rob asks, what happens if you make a mistake with tags? Uh, would it automatically point out the error? Good question. If you're using something like Glitch, or actually most text editors will actually show you the error. So here, for example, if I write EM, I made a mistake because the opening tag does not match the closing tag. Glitch like really strongly indicates on several, in several ways that there was a mistake that would be made. Uh, for large websites, you're absolutely right, Rob. For large websites, uh, the tools do indicate that there's a mistake. However, especially when you're a beginner, is, it is not always clear where the mistake is. Here, it's super clear where the mistake is. Especially, there's like a red dot and there's like an underline. But for bigger websites, it's not always clear where the mistake is. And you have to start digging and it can be very time consuming when you're a beginner. In fact, when you're a beginner, you're gonna spend a lot of tr time trying to find your mistakes. One technique which will be discussed is this little arrow here. So this can help you kind of uh, narrow down where the mistake could be. Another technique is to just delete stuff until the mistake goes away and whenever the mistake goes away, you know that you deleted the part that has the mistake. Susie asks, can you add more than one tag? 
Susie, we're going to get into that question in a few slides. Thank you for bringing that up. Can you add more than one tag? That's a very important question. And I've dedicated a whole section of this workshop to your very question. Okay, so getting back, let's go back to uh, my slideshow here. Okay, so I think this answers your question, Susie. So we have our opening tag and we have our closing tag and we have our content. On the top right of the page, there's content that is, my cat is very grumpy. This is all text. It's recognizable English text that we're all comfortable with. However, you can actually put as many uh, elements and text as you want as the content. So here I have text and then another element as the content for my div. So the content of my div contains another element. Inception. This is a common theme of this workshop. It's all about inception. Things within things. Susie, does that answer your question? I hope it does. The answer is yes. You could put a EM within a div. What if you want bold? What if you want bold and italic? Thank you. Thank you, Ria. A good question. What if you want it to be slanted and like thick, bold and italic? Um, so italic is EM. Bold, mm, does it have a tag? I forget. Good question. Uh, right, so the typical answer uh, as pointed out by Clara is you do it with CSS, which will be covered a little bit at the end of this workshop. So. Tags are a good way to change the way that things are presented. However, if you want more control or more flexibility, then we have to use another computer language, which we will cover shortly. Oh yes, it was Strong. Yeah. Thank you, Yoram. I never use Strong because I always use CSS. Okay, so there's something very important to remember or to know is how do you talk about these things? Uh, how do you reason about these things? How do you communicate your ideas or your problems with other developers? And we have a language for talking about element and content and the relationship between them. Uh, and we use family relationships. So if you think of div as a parent, then this H1 element right here, which I'm furiously pointing at, is the child. So you have a parent-child relationship. And this text element is also a child of the div. So the div is the parent of two wonderful children, one of whom is just text and the other one is a full-fledged element. Questions? No. Good, good. So as mentioned before, spaces and new lines don't matter. You can write your HTML however you want. However, there are certain styles that people prefer that are easier to read. Uh, and in fact, I think, right. Yeah, no glitch will not format it automatically. Some text editors will actually format it for you, which is nice. In fact, I can I can demonstrate that. Uh, so I'm just going to use this text editor, which is different from Glitch. This is actually something that's used in industry. So if I write something like div, hello, div, the world. Right, so in this particular text editor, which is different from Glitch, I wrote something in one line right here at the top right, right here. 
I wrote something in one line, and personally, I don't think this is very readable, but that's just my opinion. And when I save, it reformats it for me. So there are tools that will take what I write and make it more readable, which is nice, which everyone use, everyone uses. So in fact, most of the HTML you will see will actually have the same kind of formatting because people use the same tools to format them to make them easier to read. Let's see, any questions? We're good. Oh, we're good. No okay, perfect. Two syntax rules that you need to remember. <clears throat> We need to have the same number of opening tags and closing tags. So every opening tag needs a corresponding closing tag. They're pairs. They're like they're they're married, and there's no polygamy in HTML. Um, and everyone is married, and you must always close the closest opening tag. So let me demonstrate what that means with some examples. So here I have some HTML right here, and I've written the rules at the bottom so we can remember them as we are looking through these examples. So which rule am I breaking? Well, let's count the number of divs. I have one div opening and one div closing. Okay, so the number of opening divs is the same as the number of closing divs. We're good. What about H1? I have one H1 opening and no H1 closing. Oh no, I'm breaking rule number one because I'm missing a closing H1. Let's look at the next piece of code. I have one H1 opening and one H1 closing. Here's my H1 opening at the top left and the H1 closing at the bottom right. If I look at the divs of one div opening and one div closing. So the number of H1 opening is the same as the number of H1 closing. The number of div opening is the same as the number of div closing. Perfect. Rule number one is satisfied. However, if I look at rule number two, you must always close the closest opening tag. This div is incorrectly placed. It should be an H1 because I opened an H1, so I have to close the H1. So rule number two is broken. Similarly, at the next line, this H1 is closing this div, which is wrong. So I would need to flip the div and the H1 closing or opening. I would need to, this H1 to go on line number two and this div to go on line number one, or this div to go on line number two and this H1 to go on line number one. So this HTML is also incorrect. Uh, same kind of issue here. This div is not, is, is wrong, right? Because you have an H1 and I have to close an H1 not a div. So I'm breaking rule number two. H1 opening should have an H1 closing. This div opening should have a div closing at the very end. Question from Malka. She said, but for some cases as PR, no closing is no closing, right? What other often used exceptions are there? Great question, Malka. Uh, there are a few tags that are never closed and we just have to memorize them. I mean, no one uses BR, so you don't need to memorize that one. Uh, but one that is very much used, and that in fact I use all the time, is the image tag. So the tag that is used to insert images into your website. Uh, you need to just memorize them. <laughs> There's nothing more to say. What is nice is, is if you accidentally close it, it's not the end of the world. The browser will still understand you. You just might get judged by other developers. So, yeah. Uh, and also, if you use something like Glitch, Glitch will tell you 
whenever you do it so that you can fix your mistake. But it's not a huge mistake. But your browser literally does not care. The only people who care people are like judgmental web developers. Absolutely. I can live with that too. You know what? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words and judgment can't hurt me or something of the sort. Uh, okay. So I want everyone to take five minutes and to work by themselves to try and figure out which rule am I breaking for each of the three questions. Is it rule number one or is it rule number two, which are written at the bottom of the screen? So you're going to have three answers, one for each question. So right now it is 1247. I'm going to give you five minutes. And then at 1252, we will all come back and I will ask members of the audience to give me their answer. Okay, so who wants to be brave enough to speak up, use your voice, 
And for question one, tell me which rule is broken. Rule number one. I heard some noise. I said rule number one. Rule number one. What's your name, sir? Yoram. Yoram, thank you. Rule number one is being broken. No, sorry to intervene. It's actually number two. Oh, it's actually number two. We have a debate going on. Yeah, because like number one is about the number of tags and the number of tags is, is the same. The problem is the order. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, I made yeah. a mistake. Yeah, I meant two, yeah, I meant. Okay, good. So we're on the same page? Yeah. We're all good, okay. Thank you for your correction. What's your name, sir? Or madam? Actually, lady, <laughs> Malka. Malka, thank you, yeah. Malka. Thanks. Uh, great, great correction. Question number two. Malka, do you want to contribute? Yeah. For number two is, uh, is also uh, the rule number two. Rule number two for question number two, two for two. Yoram, do you agree or do you want to? Yeah, I, I can elaborate that if someone else wants to do it. Pardon me? If someone else wants to explain it. Go ahead, go ahead, Malka. Explain number two. Well, the issue is that IMG doesn't need a closing, but that is not the end of the world. The right. problem is that that closing should be close to the set. Absolutely. That's a good point. Very good, very good, Malka. Thank you for your explanation. Any other, anyone else wants to try number three? Any other brave souls? We have two brave souls so far. Can we find a third brave soul? Hi. Hello. Oh, I'll you? try number three. Number three? Yeah, it's rule number one and two. Both. Both. Because the amount of the, um, the tag that is given is, you know, there's only one OL and there's like the LI and then the slash LI. So it's not right. really equal. And then the, num the rule number two is that, you know, you didn't close on the closest opening tag name, which is the OL. There's no closing, closing tag on that. If Fair enough. OL is, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, technically, both rules are broken, but the more serious rule is rule number one. In this case, good, good answer. And what is your name? May. May, thank you for your contribution, May. So let's get right into the uh, tags that should not be closed. Even though if they are closed, it's not the end of the world. So IMG is one of them. IMG is a super important tag that you, everyone uses all the time. And technically speaking, you should not close it. So that's the exception to the rule. There are a few others. So there's BR, there's IMG, there's input. Input's another important one. And I can't think of any others off the top of my head. They're very rare. And once you start doing web development, you'll just memorize. You'll just memorize them very quickly. And if you forget, it doesn't matter. So for example, you never close IMG, you never close input, you never close BR. Any questions? Good, 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 good. Why are they never closed? Well, they don't have they don't have any content, right? An image doesn't have there's there isn't anything inside the I mean there's the image itself, but apart from the image itself, there's nothing else. BR is to indicate a new line, so it doesn't have any content. Uh, that's why it doesn't have any closing tag. So it's it's good to know why you do things, and this is the reason why. Uh, let's actually skip this part. Let's go directly into images. So 
I mean, when you go to a website, you just don't want to see text, right? You want to see some images. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words and our brains are wired to recognize images and to be able to get information from images very quickly because that's what we used to do as uh, primates back when we were evolving. through the process of taking an image and putting it on your website. So the first thing you need to do is find the image location, find the image URL. URL is also an acronym. You, uh, I think it's Unified Resource Location. But I mean, okay, for this acronym is actually somewhat useful, but no one actually uses the full People just think of URL as URL, even though it's an acronym. So let's find the URL of the image, which is basically the image's location in the cloud, to use the buzzword that everyone is using. The image location on the internet. So let's say you want a dog image. So I use Google and I click on the image tab right here. I get a whole bunch of beautiful dog. Any dog lovers in the audience? I'm sure there are. Mel asks, what if the image is in your document or PC? Well, if the image is in your document or PC, you need to find a way to put it on the cloud. And there are many hosting services that let you do that. I uh, hope that answers your question, May. So you need to upload it to the internet because no one can go, come and fetch images from your local computer. So let's see, what's the cutest one? Let's go with, oh, look at this cute one. He's wearing a mask. Let's go with this one, why not? Uh, so I just went into Google Images and I clicked on a picture I liked and then we see here a dog with presumably their child. Uh, Anna asks, you cannot embed the image directly. No, you need to find the image URL. There's no, there's no other way. You need, when a browser goes on a website it, and it encounters the IMG tag, it's going to need that URL to be able to download the image. So you can't just copy paste the image into your HTML. Rob asks stock images. You can use stock images. Uh, in fact, many of these are stock images, I presume. I don't actually know. I hope that answers your question, Rob. I didn't, uh, if, you want, if you want to ask a more specific question, I'll be glad to address it. So search for dogs, find a cute dog. Now I need to find the URL of the image. I can right click and when I right click an image, uh, a menu appears and I can just put copy image address. And now that URL is in my clipboard so I can just paste it. Oh my God, that's long. So right here, this part right here is the URL of the image. Uh, you can make an image folder, but it, the image folder has to be on the internet, it has to be in the cloud, right? Other than stock images, where can one upload their own computer's images? Very good question. So actually Glitch lets you upload images. So if you click on the assets folder, you can upload an asset and then it'll give you the opportunity to upload your image to the internet. So Glitch is great. Uh, if you have a high traffic website, Glitch is not gonna work unless you pay money. 
And then there are other websites, such as Gatorhost. Uh, Gatorhost is another one. Uh, what else? You could use Firebase Hosting, which is free, um, which is nice. I like free things. So does that answer your question? F dash T. Another question from Terry is, can you update your own images to Google Drive? Does that count as in the cloud? Mm. No, you can't. Uh, Google Drive does not give you a URL to an image. Unless I'm mistaken, but I don't think I am. I mean, possibly, I would, I would be very skeptical that Google Drive will give you a URL, but there might be a way to do it with Google Drive. I've never tried. I've never tried and no one tries. Uh, I think you can if you make the image public. Right, so, but my, Greg, I mean, you can get a link to the image, but is that link a, very, a valid URL? Um, maybe, who knows? Something to investigate. If someone could, could, could investigate that question, it would be great. So we already have a cute dog picture, right? Right here. I already have a cute dog picture. I right clicked, I got image address. This, this image is already on the internet. And all I did, oh, I closed it. All I did was open the tag and then I did something super special that I haven't done until now, which is this SRC thing right here. this magic right here, SRC equals, and then double quotes. And this super long thing, oh my God, it takes like half, like three quarters of the screen. This is the URL. And then I close the double quotes and then I finish the opening tag and an IMG does not need a closing tag. So if I look at my website, I now have an image of a dog. How cute is that? My website is an image of a dog and their child. And child looks very happy. I could put text on top of it or actually be beside it. Cutest dog ever. There we go. Cutest dog ever. What if I wanted to put the text beneath the image? This is a question for the audience. How would I put the text beneath the image? I've taught you all you need to know to answer this question. I'll answer your question, may I answer your question soon? I'm getting great answers from the chat, but does, are any of the people answering, do they want to speak up? Are they brave enough? Do we have any brave souls? No brave souls, all right. In that case, I will just demonstrate it. You put a div. So the div put... Now, if we were able to center this text, then it would be a caption. If I was able to move this text to right around here, It'd be a caption. And you might be wondering, Jack, how do you center text? And the answer is CSS. Easy things are a little harder than they seem. Nuri is asking, how come you put a text without the P bracket? Cutest dog ever, P. Right, so uh, use P, or you can use div, or you can use H1, or you can use EM. You have 
a whole set of options to use. Should you always use P for text? I mean, people typically do use P for text, but the reason is not a uh, technical. The reason isn't because you have to use P with text. Whenever you, whenever you, you take an introductory HTML course, they teach you P is for text. This is wrong. And I wish they would stop teaching this, but everyone is teaching it. Uh, and then May's question is, what's the purpose of the SRC? Good question, May. Let me just get to you, back to you, May, once I, once I complete my rant about P. Uh, you can use P if you want, and uh, P will put a little more margin, a little more space between the image and the text, which is nice. So it makes it a little more readable. But the purpose of P is that uh, it tells screen readers that this is text. And that's why people advocate using P for text, but it's not like a rule. No one is gonna come after you if you use div instead of P. Um, especially when you're starting out and you're just learning and you don't quite understand what's going on, use whatever works. And when you get more experience, then you will be able to say to yourself, okay, it's text, I should use P because a screen reader will be able to tell that it's text and this helps people with vision impairments, which is always nice. I love helping people with vision impairments. I don't know who answered that, asked that question, but I hope that my long-winded and rambling answer was able to address it. Uh, we had a question, what is SRC? Good question. I, uh, Ria, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the question you just read? Yes. Okay, so SRC is used with IMG, you put it after the tag name, don't forget the space, to specify the location of the image. So it goes inside the opening tag, right beside the tag name. And the syntax is SRC equals and then double quotes the location and then you end the double quote. I hope that answers your question. I don't know who asked it, let me check. Oh, it was May. I hope that answers your question, May. If it didn't, ask it again and I will, maybe you could ask it slightly differently. So I'll have a better idea of what to explain. So those are the two steps. First, you find the URL of the image and you can use Google. Google is a great way to do it. And then you place it inside of an IMG tag using the SRC attribute. So what is a URL, right? Well, it starts with HTTP or HTTPS always, followed by a colon and a slash slash. And then just a whole bunch of characters. <laughs> Often there's a www, sometimes not. Sometimes you have an org, sometimes you have a com, sometimes you have a net, sometimes you have a CA, etc. But you do not need to worry about the details of what's here. However, when you do see an HTTP or HTTPS, you should think to yourself, oh, that's a URL. So we saw SRC and in fact, SRC is called an attribute and different tags have different attributes. Uh, so with IMG, you can use SRC. IMG has other attributes that you can also use like height and width, which are sometimes useful. And you can put as many attributes as you want for any given tag. And the meaning of the attribute will depend on the tag. So for if the tag is I if the tag name is IMG, then the SRC at the meaning behind the SRC attribute is as the location of the file in the cloud. And do not forget the double quotes. Uh, forgetting double quotes is insidious because sometimes you forget them and it works and sometimes you forget them and it doesn't work. So it's always important to get in the good habit of making sure the double quotes are there at the beginning and the end. 
Otherwise, it'll trip you up. So the audience asked the question, the audience wants to know, now that we are HTML professionals, we all want to hear about CSS. How do I change the text color, the font size, the background color, the spacing? How do I place stuff in different positions on the website? Uh, and this is the this is the more aesthetic and design oriented aspect of web development. So the first thing you need to do when you're doing CSS is first figure out what you're trying to do. And step, step number one is identify what you want to change. So do you want to change the font size, the color, etc. And you need to figure out what part of the website you want to change it. And then you're going to have to come up with a name. That name is going to link your HTML and your CSS. That name is the bridge between HTML and CSS. And then you're going to have to write down some CSS. And then you're going to have to modify the HTML. So Somebody right here, a question. Oh, we have a question. Two questions, yeah. So Yoram said, I tried uploading an image to Google Drive and then using the link. Unfortunately, it didn't work. And then uh, Huda asked, sorry, can you repeat why we need quote? OK, good, good questions. Yoram, that, that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, I doubt that you can get Google Drive to host your images. I think there might be a way, Yoram. I think there is a way to do it on Google Drive, but it's complicated. Uh, it's not as simple as just uploading it. Huda, uh, who, let's address Huda's question about double quotes. Uh, why do we need them? Um, Because otherwise, sometimes it won't work. Having double quotes really tells the browser that whatever is in between the double quotes is the value of that attribute. If you forget to put the double quotes, sometimes the browser is going to figure it out. Oh, this attribute has this value. But sometimes it's going to make a mistake, um, especially if there's a space in the value. You're gonna need you're gonna need double quotes. So hopefully that answers your question, Huda. A uh, question from May is: Do the quotes only work for inserting images or files? Uh, you use the you use double quotes anytime you have an attribute. So anything anytime you have something beside a tag name in an opening tag. So if the attribute is SRC, you need double quotes. If the attribute is something else, you still need double quotes for the value. I hope that answers your question. And okay. Perfect. CSS, this is the diagram. This thing is explains every part of very basic use case of CSS. So at the bottom, we have the HTML that we love and adore. Uh, at the top, we have a style tag that's closed right here. And the content of the style tag is CSS, which is another language. So you learn HTML and now you have to learn CSS. And once you learn CSS, then you have to learn JavaScript. It's never ending. And once you learn JavaScript, you have to learn React. It just keeps going on and on. Always learning. If you like learning, web development for you because you never stop. So some new things here in the HTML, there's an attribute we never saw, which is the class attribute. So we've seen the SRC attribute. This is the class attribute. <clears throat> the class attribute can actually be put on any tag. 
And here we have some name, which I've named some name to really indicate the fact that I, as the creator of this website, selected some name. I am the creator of some name. Some name is arbitrary. I could have called it whatever I want. What is important is that I use the same thing here as here. They have to match exactly. Also the dots important. So uh, notice in the HTML, I have a class attribute and the value some name. And in the CSS, I have dot some name followed by curly bracket, closing curly. <clears throat> in the middle, I have the property value uh, and property name. So what's in the middle here will determine what changes will be applied to the element. And the color property name is used when you want to modify the font color. And red is the value. So the text color is going to be red. Also notice there is a colon between color and red. It is very important when you're learning anything related to computer languages that you pay attention to the punctuation. You really have to make sure that your punctuation is absolutely exact. You need to make sure there is a curly brace here and a curly brace here. You need to make sure there's a semicolon. You need to make sure there's a dot. If you mess up in any way, it's not going to work. And you might not know why it's not working. Any questions? Should we use IDs or should we use stick to classes? So should we just stick to classes, sorry? Good question, Yoram. Well, uh, IDs is not something we have covered yet in the workshop. So if you don't know what an ID is, uh, don't worry, I didn't explain it. Um, Typically, people prefer classes, Yoram. So you should stick with classes. That's what the industry prefers. OK, so generally speaking, this is another theme in computer programming. Everything is always an instance of a more general pattern. And this color colon red is a general pattern. And the pattern is property name colon property value. And you might be asking yourself, Jack, what CSS properties exist? And I will answer, good question. Hundreds or even maybe thousands. I don't know. I, I'm not keeping count. There's a lot. And what you can do is you can just Google whenever you need one, right? Um, for example, background color. I searched, I want to change the background color. So I searched background color CSS and boom, W3 schools. W3 Schools, great website, highly recommended. Even has an example. Background color coral. In fact, W3 Schools is such a good website that they actually let you try it yourself. And this is what coral looks like on a computer screen. And you can even change it. You can even put red, blue, Purple, green. For those of you who know hex, you can put hex numbers. I don't know what this color is. Oh, it's going to be a gray. That's a nice gray. Mm, love it.
Where was I? I got lost in my gray. Property name, colon, property value. Color, colon, red. Don't forget the semicolon at the end. Font size, oh. There are a ton of errors here. I'm gonna give you five minutes. It is uh, 122, you have until 127. Wait, can I ask a quick question Absolutely. from Mylin? She said, do we have to specify not black text even if we said we wanted red? Uh, right, so I should probably, let me show you what this website actually displays. So not like, oh, why is it not showing? Hmm. That is very, oh, that's because of this. Here we go. And not black text is, is, is the actual text. So you can write whatever you want here. And it's going to be a red. I hope that answers your question, Milan. You can write whatever you want here. Yes, she said thank you. Perfect. Yes, okay, break activity, find all the errors. You have until uh, 128.
Okay. So how many errors did you find? Write in the chat how many errors you found. I want a number. Seven, three. Three, four, six. So many found seven errors. It's a lot. Okay, so first error. There should be a dot beside the foo bar. It's one. Second error. Font size needs a colon after. It's error number two. Error number three, there needs to be a semicolon after 14 pixels. Oh yes, May, there should also be a style tag at the very, right before the foo bar. So we forgot the style tag. Let me just show you the style tags. We're missing the style tag right here. So we're at four, five, well, I mean, four is also going to include the closing style tag. Five, class is missing an S. And six, you should put double quotes uh, in a foo bar. If you forget the double quotes, it will still work, but I consider it an error because I want you guys to always put double quotes. Otherwise you're gonna run into trouble. So I got six, Susie. I don't know how you got seven. Oh, you can't do the, the style two times. Okay, perfect. So we're on the same page. We're, we're, we're synchronized. So one question you might have Actually, before I show this more complicated way, let me show a simpler way. So let's let's work on this caption. Do you guys see the caption on from lines three to five? Let's work on it. Let's make it more captiony. Adding some CSS. Somebody give me a name. Somebody write a name in chat. Any name. A word. Any word. Somebody pick a word. No one wants to write a word? Okay, the word is word. The word is great. Sebastian contributed the word word. So notice that the word goes in the style, but it also goes in the class. You need both. And word is going to connect the HTML and the CSS. So we want to uh, we want to center the we want to center the text right here. We want this text to go in the middle. One way is we can use the text align property name with a value of center. And boom, our text is centered. So that's how you can center text. What if you wanted to center an image? or anything else than text. So we're gonna get into the more complicated, a little more complicated topic is if you wanna center things that are not text, such as images, you need to use uh, this magic formula, which I've labeled centering magic. And if you use the centering magic, then the children will be centered. 
So the centering magic is display flex and justify content centering. Both of them need to be used. Not just one, both. So there are at least two methods. There are actually several ways to center things in CSS. There's just text. There is the text align center. And if it's anything but text, you can use display flex and justify content center. So I just wanted to dive a little, scratch the surface of a little more complicated topic, which is flex to get you a taste of what you can do in more advanced positioning techniques available to you in CSS. Questions. Now it's general question time. Anyone who's been holding back? No one's been holding back? Just as general questions about anything related to web development. While you are thinking about your questions. Uh, McGill University, we are offering a full stack JavaScript development program starting in March. A oh, quick question from Anna. She said, any security concerns? Any what? Security concerns? Security concerns. Hmm. If, when you look at the, uh, the security of a a website, a web application, there's nothing inherently insecure about a browser's, a, a user's experience. And that's because when you go to a random website, you have, n you know nothing about the intent of the creator of that website. He could be the most evil person in the world. Uh, and he will try his best to, unless, He'll try his best to further his own interests at the cost of your own interests, possibly, right? Evil people exist in the world. Well, that's debatable. People who put websites to extract money from you exist in the world. There, that there's no doubt. And so what browser, create, browser vendors such as Google and Apple and Mozilla Foundation have done is they've made it so that browsers will actually protect you. And unless you do something like entering your credit card number into the website, there's very little that a website creator can do to uh, inflict harm or steal your data. So from a HTML and CSS perspective, there isn't really much to think about from a security point of view because a browser really protects whoever visits your website. I Any hope the explanation from... wasn't too long and I hope it addressed your issue. Another question from Anya is, where can I find tutorials on CSS? Oh, that is, that is a, a big question, Anna. Anya, Anya, that is a big question, Anya. You have several resources. W3 Schools is a good one. And they have tutorials on a whole bunch of different topics related to HTML and CSS. I also have my own resource, which I've created. It's a little more advanced, um, but if you are highly motivated, I'm gonna put the link in the chat. So that's the resource I created for my students. And I use it in my class, but it's a little harder and in my opinion, will get you to a much higher level of mastery than something like W3Schools. 
They also have things like Code Academy, um, Free Code Camp, etc. And then a question from Irina is, is there any textbook on HTML or CSS you would recommend for beginners? I, based on my limited research, I haven't been able to find a textbook that I found particularly useful. And when doing this kind of work, it's always nice to be able to apply it. So to be on your computer, I find that th this kind of learning does lend itself to more interactive experience that can only be found on a website. So I've never found any book that I particularly would recommend. Are those the only questions, Ria? Yes, at the moment. Okay. I've also included the email, our email, which is pd.content.miguel.ca for any further questions. So, uh, as I was saying, we have a full stack JavaScript development program at Miguel, starts in March. We teach HTML and CSS, of course, because it's an important part of full stack, de full stack development. We teach a lot of JavaScript. It's very applied. It's really very relevant to what's happening on the job market. And there's an inform in information session coming up and you will get an invitation to our information session. Perfect. And two other questions, one from Rob who is asking, would you use HTML or CSS to animate text? You can use CSS to animate text. Well, it depends what kind of animations you want. You can use CSS to move text, to rotate text, to change the shadow of a text to animate the, the color of the text or the color of the background. But uh, yeah, you and can use CSS for that. Okay. And a question from Tommy, uh, he said, what was the VC, I'm sorry, VSC extension for auto formatting? Uh, good question from Tommy. So I use prettier. Why do I use prettier? I use prettier because the default one, I think there's a default one, and the default one would actually delete my code, which is insane. So I'd be writing code and then I would get it formatted and then parts of my code would be missing. And this happened like 30 times. And at, at some point I decided to switch to prettier. At some point I realized that my formatter was deleting my code, which is which, mind blowing, right? Uh, so it's prettier. I think it's the, it's the most popular one. There's also another one called Beautify, which is slightly less popular. So we're talking 10 million versus 6 million. Okay, and some questions. Uh, so a comment from Tommy who said, by the way, nice job for the Wakata site. We'll dive deep into it. And then Clara asks, how long is the full stack JavaScript training? So the full stack JavaScript training will be uh, is currently offered as a part-time program for those of you who work. Uh, that one is a year and a half. However, this summer, we are planning to offer a bootcamp version of the program, and that's going to be 12 weeks, uh, so, but very intense every day. And then a question from Sebastian, he's asking, what do we need to master before attending the full stack JavaScript development program? So good question from Sebastian. Uh, technically speaking, it's designed for people without any background. However, the more you learn and the more you will get out of the program, of course. Um, so you don't need to master anything per se. But if you do learn uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript, the more you know before coming in and the more you'll benefit from the program because you'll be able to tackle harder problems and I'll be there to help you tackle those harder problems. So HTML, CSS and JavaScript are really all that you learn in this full stack JavaScript development. 
So if you could play around and maybe build a few things so you could get exposed to the, the whole ecosystem, it would be helpful. Uh, and another question from Bill. He said, if I try to develop a website for my courses, who shall I get in touch with for some quick assistance answering my questions? Well, the instructor of the course. The instructor All of, of our course? instructor are pretty available and they are always open to questions from students outside of course hours. Yeah, absolutely. That's why that's that's our job. <laughs> yeah. This is this is what we do. We help students with their projects and homework. Or we also have teaching assistants for some courses. Great. I don't see any other questions. Great. So Uh, there's a uh, information session, Programming Your Future, Kickstart Your Career as a Web Developer. And that's happening uh, next week, I believe. So you will get an invitation to this event as well as a link to with the contents of this video. I'm going to share with you my email in the chat. There, okay, and there are two more questions. Uh, one is from Mary, Marie France who's asking, why is the name of the program not just full stack web development instead of JavaScript web development? Uh, good question, Marie-France. Uh, it is because the only programming language you will learn is JavaScript. You will learn JavaScript on the back end, on the front end. It's a very versatile language. This is a differentiating factor with other programs where they teach slightly, I would argue a little less relevant uh, at the moment. Languages like Ruby, also, I believe that uh, as beginners, I don't think it's a great idea to teach two languages. We only teach one. And it's the only one you need to be a full stack developer. And Anna's question is a Java versus HTML. Uh, so they serve completely different purposes. The Java programming language and uh, HTML is a markup language. So HTML is to tell the browser what needs to be displayed, whereas Java is to create computer applications. So it, it, they're not comparable. Uh, and then uh, Kirti asks, when do we suppose to have more information about the bootcamp you mentioned? Good um, question. Kurti, by signing up to this event, you are now part of our mailing list and we shall email you to inform you when we will be launching our exciting new bootcamp. It will start at the end of May is what we are planning at the moment. And Clara asks, is it possible to take the training if we are not bilingual? You need to speak English. Well, you need to be able to understand what I'm saying. So as long as you understand what I'm saying, um, that's great. That's all you need. Yes. Yeah, so although the courses are taught in English, uh, Miguel's policy is that you can submit any assignment or take any exam in French if you wish to do so. All right. I've had Francophone students in the past, and as long as they have a level of English that's good enough to understand what I was saying, that, that was perfectly fine. There was no issue. All right. So uh, I, I have, I've, I created some exercises for those of you who want a challenge. So feel free to do them. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Oh, this link is wrong. I changed it. And for the next 15 minutes, I'm here until 2 p.m. to answer your questions. If you have questions about the exercises in this document or you want to know more about our programs, 
I'm here for the next 13 minutes. Question from Irina. What is your stance on CA domain names? Good question, Irina. So it depends on, this is a marketing question more than a development question, but it depends on your target market. So if you're developing something that's specific to the Canadian market, such as, I don't know, uh, uh, a web application for the dairy farmers of Alberta, then .ca is a great domain name. If you're developing something for a more international market, you might want to consider alternative domain names such as com or uh, some people like IO is another good one. My website is wakata.io. Um, I forget what the other ones are, but there's quite a few. There's biz now, I think. Academy is a domain. So yeah, depends on your market, your target market. My pleasure, Sage writes, thanks for the course. As long as you are learning something, that is thanks enough for me. Uh, Bonnie writes, how do you publish what you create on Glitch? Everything you click on Glitch is published on its own domain. So I think the question is, how do you make this? So something like bonniemac.com. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bonnie. Would you like to publish this website on bonniemac.com or something of the sort? Well, uh, actually on my bonniemac.com, I have WordPress. But if I just wanted to create a simple one pager, I think which could be kind of handy. So I'm just looking into it. It's good to know all the basic stuff. But what like I, I actually have someone helping me with my other website, but I wanted to just know more personally. So if when I create something on Glitch, it gives me uh, a sort of page. I guess I'd have to log and create a profile, and it gives it gives me space, right? And so basically, if I had a, a website address, the domain that I've bought, I would have to point that to that other, the glitch address, is that it? Right, so you actually, if you wanted that particular functionality, you'd have to pay glitch. I think that's a premium service. Okay, to have, uh, to be able to point it to a specific domain name. Right, so what you can do is for free, you can redirect it to your glitch address. But if you want your domain to be displayed here at the top, instead of chattertangyforce.glitch.me, you wanted your own custom domain, you need to pay Glitch some money. Okay, so what do you mean by if I was to redirect? So if I was to redirect, just say I, I don't have a creative bonniemac.com website and I went, typed in bonniemac.com. So whoever, I would have to do it through whoever is hosting my domain and have it redirect to my Glitch. I, yeah, so if, that. But if you did that, then the people who go on your glitch would not yeah. see your domain at the top. They would see- No, I just wonder, I'm just trying to understand the difference between what yeah. you're talking about. Cause you're saying like when you redirect, cause I do notice like some people have their websites and it just comes up and doesn't come with their name or anything. It just has their name as a uh, part of where, where whatever uh, URL, whatever, whatever is hosting their private space for their website. Right. Yeah, so, and you can also change the name here, right? So you can do Bonnie Mac. And now it's bonniemac.glitch.me. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm going so to. You can change that in. Pardon me? You, so you can change that within Glitch to have a little bit more personalized if I wanted to. Yeah. Something. In fact, I recommend that you sign up to Glitch and you take it. I'm going to change it back before somebody else does. Okay. So it is a way to have a simple, like people, especially small things like people just say, oh, I'm doing this wedding. These are the wedding pics or the blah, blah, blah and all that stuff. They don't need necessarily need a commercial site. Like yeah, I'll probably absolutely. end up doing another WordPress site, but uh, just to understand the functionality, Glitch is very new to me. Yeah, especially if you're learning and you wanna do something fun while you're learning and you have a personal project, I think it's a great idea. 
Okay, but Glitch itself does not have a the service where you can upload the photos like WordPress does, where you can upload photos. As well, you a, can upload library. into the assets folder right here. Oh, they have one. They do. Okay, so that's the kind of like the library, right? Where yeah. I could put. So I could just upload it into the assets on Glitch itself, and then point use my URL. Uh, put that into point to my URL to get that picture, right? Yeah, so uh, once you upload it, Glitch is going to supply you a URL that you can put in your HTML. And I guess it, there is a, there's a maximum file size too, right? Probably. And also for the assets, is it just images or can I do PDFs or anything like that? You can put anything you want. Okay, so I could just- But you one. can't use an IMG tag unless it's an image. Yes. I would just have to use a, what kind of tag do you use if it's, if it's a document? So if it's a PDF, yes, there is no tag for it. People have to download the PDF. So you would use an, an anchor tag so that they can download the PDF. And what does that look like? Uh, it would look like. So I would upload the PDF into my assets and then I would program that. I'm just something like that. I'll put it in the chat for you. Okay. Okay. And then you can put anything in the URL. It could be a document, it could be. Uh, yeah, and that as would long come as it's the, URL. The, uh, the URL that's provided via the assets. The asset yeah, but but the, the PDF will not be embedded into your website. It's going no, to. No, it would be like they would click on it and then it, it yeah. would open within and ask them to, do you want to download this? Right, or if it's a PDF, actually it'll open it on the, it'll open a new tab or something. Oh, uh, like Google does, like yeah. Gmail does. Okay, thank you. Welcome, we have other questions. Uh, May asks, are we getting some kind of certification from this course? If you're referring to this workshop, the answer is no. If you're referring to the full stack JavaScript development program, you do get a certificate a professional development certificate at the end of your studies, assuming you finish all 10 courses. Marie-France writes, do you use Webflow? I've never used Webflow. Um, I don't plan to use Webflow. It's not really useful for my needs, but I'm very interested in finding out who it's, who it's for and what it really does for them. So I've never used it. You're welcome, Alexandra. It is my pleasure to provide this workshop. Uh, Rob asks, mobile version websites use the same language, HTML? The answer is yes. Mobile websites use HTML and CSS. And to make a website that works well, both on desktop and on mobile, you have to do some fancy CSS things called media queries uh, so that things are resized according to what screen you're being used. Uh, you're welcome, Juana, Nadina, FT, Olga, Clara. Sebastian asks, if I buy Sebastian.com, what do I use to program my own website, my own web page? no WordPress, et cetera. Uh, good question. You can use a hosting service like, you need to basically get your HTML, CSS images and maybe JavaScript onto the cloud. So you need to use something like HostGator is a cheap one or Firebase hosting is a free one. And once you uploaded your files, you can then redirect Sebastian. You can direct Sebastian.com to HostGator or Firebase hosting. Irina asks, does Glitch have a responsive website preview? It's not built into Glitch, but uh, if you right click and you click on inspect and then you click on the phone right here, this is on Chrome. I don't know how it works in other browsers. You can get a mobile preview of your website. 
So that you can get a preview on, on Chrome or Safari or Firefox by clicking on the, by clicking somewhere, depending on which browser you're using. I hope that answers your question, Irina. Uh, J.M. Pelletier asks, so the program for weekend is a year and a half? That is correct, Mr. J.M. Pelletier. Uh, Bonnie, you're welcome, always a pleasure. Uh, you're welcome, Sebastian, and you're welcome, Irina. So it is now 2 p.m. Thank you all for attending. It was a pleasure to help you learn first few steps into HTML and CSS. And for those of you who decide to join us for the information session or to sign up for one of the for the program, uh, I'll be glad to engage with you further. Jose, the recording will be sent by email. Oh, I'm going to leave my email again for Terry. Feel free to message me directly at jacques.lenormand at mcgill.ca. It's in the chat. It's also my first name dot my last name. And uh, have a nice day. Enjoy, enjoy the beautiful weather, the blue sky. And on that note, I will close my the meeting. Bye, everyone.